So, good afternoon uh, to everybody and good morning also for uh, US uh, colleagues. My name is uh, Davide Corinaldesi. I'm working uh, for Cesar uh, Deployment uh, Manager uh, as uh, um, Project Manager for the uh, DLS implementation in, uh, in Europe. Today, I'm going to give you a short presentation related to our activities, the SDM activities related to the new data link technologies deployment. And of course, the focus is on LDAX. The presentation is uh, composed by four uh, sections. First, I would like just to remind you the SDM role and main activities that we are performing in the DLS environment then we would like to recall you the sdm recommendation for the future implementation of dls then i would like to mention how to implement the new technologies and how these would be included in the cns evolution plan and finally just to remind you some final remarks in the first section about sdm rule um, you already know probably you already know our activities in the DLS framework. Of course, uh, we are working under the regulatory framework that is uh, composed by the implementing rule 29, amended by the 310. So we are speaking about uh, ATN uh, base, um, baseline one services. And then we have also the implementing rule 30 related, related to the uh, law and none. Of course, uh, as per mandate, uh, we are working also in uh, CP1 implementing rule. Now it's implementing 116. And of course, uh, we are working on specific requests of the European Commission and the ASA. Regarding the deliverables that we have uh, taken into account in, in, uh, in our work, we can mention the two uh, main relevant deliverables that are the ASA report and then the ELSA, ELSA study that was one of the uh, major input for our work. In our context, of course, we are working, we worked in the SEF framework with the two uh, big projects related to the DLS uh, deployment. And then we started from an initial deployment of the data link in Europe that was already started when SDM role was recognized. It was recognized through two mandates from the European Commission, the first to assume the role of the DLS implementation project manager, responsible for organizing, implementing, and monitoring all the activities identified in the DLS recovery plan. It was in October 2016. The second one is related to the, um, the mandate to requesting to SDM to focus our attention and resources in the DLS recovery and then uh, in the implementation and the definition and then implementation of the target solution for DLS. Of course, in this, in this way, we are laying down the basis for the DLS future evolution. And here we are in January 2017. According to these uh, mandates, uh, we have used the DLS recovery plan. And in this recovery plan from the beginning, so in 2016, the complementary technology is so called complementary technologies or new technologies to put together with the DMO2 were already included. So uh, for us, it is nothing new that we would like to complement the current technology implemented and we would like to improve the current DLS, also giving a look to the future uh, services and aspects. In fact, the adoption of complementary technologies uh, for us uh, is necessary to offload the VDM2 network, also to extending its uh, lifespan and also to support the introduction of new data link services, for example, ADSC with EPP. Then the adoption of these complementary technologies for sure will uh, help, will uh, enhance the performances and also the flexibility or future data link systems in providing the service. It is nothing new. ELSA staff recommended also to, to consider alternative communication means, especially for AOC at the time, with a priority in the airport domain, because at the time we were considering only the VDM2. So at the end, the tentative was to protect as much as possible the en route area. 
But when uh, we speak about uh, the introduction of uh, new uh, complementary technologies or new technologies, uh, it's clear that we are already in operation. So we need also to give a look at a smooth transition from the current system based only on VDM2 towards uh, other data link systems that will be based on uh, multiple technologies. So we need to pay a lot of attention in managing this transition in a smooth way. So at the end, in the DLS recovery plan that was uh, written in uh, 2016, the use of complementary technologies uh, was expected as from 2025. It's clear at the time we didn't have any, any idea about what happened regarding the, the, the COVID crisis, but again, this date more or less is still, is still valid in our opinion. Then what we would, would like to recommend for the future, it is written in the document D11.1.1 that we have produced in 2020. It was also submitted to the, a large consultation of the interest of the stakeholders through the SDM platform. And here we were very clear, we need to introduce complementary technologies, we need to complement the VDM2. This is because uh, we need to start to see the DLS as a pan-European service. So our recommendation is to consider uh, not a local service, but a pan in order to reduce or minimize all the problems that we had in implementing DLS. Uh, looking to this uh, new approach that uh, we are proposing, uh, our idea is to establish a DLS governance for, and the data link service provider and here we are speaking about the management level of the future pan-European DLS. And we are happy today to say that an initiative that was started by S6 is going to reach this, uh, this target. The second, the second recommendation is to fully deploy the DLS architecture uh, number two that was identified during the, the SEF call projects. And this architecture number two includes also the so-called ATN European uh, backbone, so the CIAB, the Common European ATN backbone. And it could facilitate uh, the uh, deployment also of the new technologies. And here we are in the technical level. Finally, it's clear that we need to give a look to the future. We need to do, uh, give a look to the future, introducing a complementary communication technologies and also future data link services. And, for, and we have now the new implementing rule regarding the DSC with the EPP. So new technologies and data link services are again in our recommendation that we have produced in February 2020. Of course, uh, together with the recommendation, we have produced also a sort of, uh, let me say, initial timeline. So the governance establishment was expected in Q1 of 2021, and maybe we will reach it in Q3 or Q4 of this year. So there is uh, just a small delay. But what is relevant is that we will have the DSP establishment, the DSP in operation. But what is really relevant for the today webinar is that we are considering also the new technologies. The new technologies, we have this, this line, and of course, the first one already for service provision was considered is the SATCOM. Then we have a new ground-based technologies like LDAX. And uh, these dates were expected around 22 and then 2025. But again, this map was produced before the COVID crisis. But we are still more or less there because there, we are indicating just uh, the initial uh, initial dates. Having said that, uh, what about the CNS evolution plan? It's clear that uh, uh, DLS is part, or data link system is part of the infrastructure, and infrastructure is part of the communication. The communication is part of the CNS. So at the end, uh, we need to deploy infrastructure, even if we are considering uh, just a technology for the air ground segment, but we need to deploy an infrastructure. And we have to see this deployment as part of a large plan that would uh, interest CNS. In this case, uh, just some uh, suggestions from our side, we identified some prerequisites and also some requirements that are needed for the deployment. 
of course, we are basing our analysis on the lesson learned we had with the, with the VDM2. About the prerequisite, uh, I can mention uh, the achievement of the technology maturity. We must be sure that the technology is really mature. So we need to intensively test and then we need to prevent IOP issues that are still unfortunately part of the problems that we are facing today with the VDMO2. Then we need also full standards definition without uh, any, let me say, reducing the possibility uh, to give a different uh, uh, reading. Then, after the full standards definition, uh, it's clear that with the clear technical requirements, so the way in uh, um, translating the standards in something uh, technical should be very, very clear without uh, any, any problem on that. Otherwise, we could have problems later on. Of course, if we would like to deploy something new, we need the availability of airborne and ground components. Then the transition plan definition, as said before, and especially for the uh, LDAX, I can mention the transition from the current link OSI system implemented in Europe towards the new IPS, because we know LDAX is uh, IPS native. And uh, the last but not the least for sure, we need the stakeholders buy-in. So we need uh, to have a clear plan agreed with all stakeholders involved. For sure, it could facilitate. Having these prerequisites, the deployment for the deployment, the requirements are, in our opinion, a strong project management, for sure. We need a nice coordination among the European bodies that will be involved. And of course, again, we need a strong engagement of the interested stakeholders in Europe and possibly also not European stakeholders. We are already working in this, uh, in this uh, list of prerequisites. We are working uh, in uh, trying to define as much as possible uh, uh, today in this, uh, uh, in this field. And of course, we are supporting also the related European bodies and also the DLS interested stakeholders. Here we have just an example. We have just an example. We started to prepare a sort of a roadmap uh, to cover the future implementation of the CP1 regulation. And it's clear that in this case, we have to consider the airborne domain, for example, and then we need also to, to consider the airborne ground domain, so the communication segment, air ground communication segment. And here uh, we are expecting to have a multi-link environment for sure. And we expect also to have a really long transition from ATN OSI towards ATN IPS, because for sure the aircraft that we are putting in operation today, for sure we stay with us for until 20, 25 years. And uh, we have also to consider this long transition and having in this long transition both systems. It's also clear uh, that today we have a lot of boxes, uh, white boxes with the dotted lines where we need to fill with some clear plans in our opinion before to start the large deployment. So we need, for example, to understand the clear plans for the ATN IPS on board, clear plans about ATN IPS implementation on the ground, and of course, also how to manage this uh, multi-link environment. All these elements are, un are under our radar. We are working on there. Of course, we would like to work on that uh, together with the stakeholders. That's for sure. Then we can give a look uh, to the future. The SDM uh, has elaborated the CSR deployment plan. The consultation of this relevant document is just uh, uh, finished some days ago. In this document, we are indicating also the technological enablers that are needed for the F6 implementation. F6 is the part of the uh, CSR deployment plan related to the implementation of the CP1 regulation. So at the end, directly uh, related to the DLS. SDM is supporting, as I said before, uh, the activities uh, of the CNS advisory group related to the future European CNS infrastructure. 
And therefore, we are supporting the definition of the CNS evolution plan that I said before, should include also the new communication technologies, for example, LDACs, and then this plan could support the SDP implementation. And finally, we support not only the definition of this CNS evolution plan, but we are supporting also the deployment of this, uh, this plan that should be performed in an harmonized way according to the CNS advisory group guidelines that will be uh, produced. So, the final remarks of this very short uh, presentation, SDM recommends to take into account the past experience. The VDM02 implementation lesson left is clear to all of us and must be taken into account to prevent future IOP issues and prevent also potential fragmentation in preventing also, for example, LDACs or any other kind of new technologies at the end. So the lesson learned for us is our main guideline. Then, as the MSA said before, uh, is already working in the prerequisites definition. We are supporting the European bodies and also the DLS interest the stakeholders in this uh, uh, very relevant uh, uh, step and uh, this work uh, in our opinion uh, uh, should be done before the large deployment of the new communication technologies because we need to minimize the associated risk risks are everywhere in any program the risks are part of the program and in some cases are also beneficial because if we identify the, the risks uh, we can also to prevent the problems and this is it's very relevant for us SDM is also available to provide our support. So we are uh, providing our support in the pre-deployment activities, for example, in the testing phases. Again, we would like to minimize the risks in the future large deployment phases. And uh, finally, the last but not the least for sure, we are working with a global approach. We have perfectly understood the problems of the space users, for example, in the need to equip the uh, aircraft with the different technologies, it could be a problem. And having also multi stacks on board sometimes is not easy to manage. And this is the reason why we would like to follow this global approach. We are cooperating also with FIA, our US colleagues, for the implementation of same DLS services, same protocols, and then also same technologies, at least in the medium long term and if possible around the world. Again, uh, these are our final remarks of this very short uh, presentation. I would like to thank you, you all for your attention. I'd like to thank you the um, organization of this uh, interesting uh, uh, webinar for uh, uh, inviting uh, SDM. Of course, uh, if you have uh, questions, if you wish to ask for questions, I will be available later on in the dedicated slot. Thank you again for your attention. I don't know if I can give back the floor to our uh, close Peter, to our chairman. Try to sh share my screen. Okay, so you should see my screen now. Yes, Laura. Yes, I can see it. Perfect. Okay, so thank you for uh, inviting us uh, to today to present uh, airline view, uh, an airline perspective uh, around LDAX. Uh, so, for those who do not uh, know the JERG, the JERG is an um, uh, airline uh, joint group uh, speaking about CNS uh, requirements. Um, so, requirements uh, for today, but uh, especially for the future uh, on communication, navigation, and surveillance. So, we had a meeting last week, uh, JERG number 80, where we spoke about LDAX, and I will uh, give you the main feedbacks uh, we have uh, for this uh, new system. Uh, before we start, just a word on the on the communication context for us airlines. 
uh, in uh, 2021 and, and the coming years. Um, we have at the top of the screen, uh, of course, the, 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 let's say the regulation and uh, what is requested. So we add uh, the ATNB1 mandate, uh, which is now, uh, of course, behind, but we still have some, uh, some issues and, uh, and the login list to, to manage. We've got the ATNB2, which uh, is supposed to come in the coming years, uh, with a uh, line fit mandate to equip the aircraft with, uh, with, with a new um, uh, ATN uh, system. Uh, with the application, which are not that clear today. Uh, regarding this ATN, uh, we are still uh, in an area where the harmonization is not there yet, and we are really looking forward to having this, uh, this harmonization uh, throughout Europe. And uh, in the future now, we have, uh, the, well, let's say the, the TBO operations uh, and still some questions around. Uh, regarding the VDL, uh, like David said, uh, we have today, uh, let's say, enough to cover the ATNB1. We foresee a saturation. I will say a word about that next uh, in, in the next slides. And uh, we have to probably some offload uh, to, to, to implement on that. And on the VDL, we have some projects like the advanced VDL, which is still question, uh, but, uh, but could be an option. Regarding the future communication, here we've got a lot of path uh, coming, a lot of possibilities. Uh, still, uh, some are on the paper. Uh, some are coming uh, soon, like uh, the SATCOM IRIS. Uh, we have the LDAX, we have the Aeromax, we've got we have the uh, I, uh, the, um, the hyperconnected uh, ATM. And we have also some possible uh, implementation like uh, SAT voice or uh, uh, SAT uh, VHF. So as you can see, there are a lot of, in, in yellow, you can see the possible uh, retrofit impact for our aircraft. Uh, you can see that uh, in the next years, there are possible, uh, possibly a lot of uh, yellow boxes. So a lot of uh, retrofit possible and, uh, and a lot of choices. Um, you can see also here on the on the left part of the screen that we have, uh, let's say, a, a decision window uh, for our aircraft. Uh, that is to say that for line fit or retrofit, we have at least two or three years uh, between a decision and the implementation of a system. So uh, if we take uh, this window today, uh, we are now reaching, uh, let's say, the SATCOM IRIS uh, system in this decision window. That is to say that we, we can now uh, very soon decide to implement this system. And this window will move to the right uh, to possibly uh, implement the available choices. So as you can say, uh, LDAX is not currently on, the, on this window. It's uh, still far away, but uh, it's time to, uh, to, to start thinking about that and I will explain it uh, in the next slides. Um, now, what about LDAX? Uh, on the paper, uh, it's a very promising technology. Uh, we fully support the LDAX potential uh, benefits that uh, have been presented in the previous webinars. Uh, the performance is, uh, is there on the paper, as RCP60, the bandwidth is, uh, is uh, very nice, very good. Uh, it's a secure the pipe uh, IPS technology. Uh, it's an aviation spectrum, which is quite important in, in the moments where we have some uh, interferences subject. So that's, a, that's an important advantage. Uh, it could provide some opportunities for us for the AOC and also the EFD. I will say some words about that. Then digital voice, GBAS. And the most important perhaps is that the fact that it's not only a COM technology, but uh, uh, it can bring some benefits on the C, the N and the S uh, part of the CNS, uh, especially bringing a real uh, ap and solution, uh, which has to be perhaps more investigated, investigated uh, especially when we speak uh, about uh, the, the FMC, uh, GNSS uh, configuration, which could also bring some uh, redundance and uh, to, to the the current GNSS. So a lot of, uh, lot of promises, uh, very interesting for us, not a single uh, communication system. 
So uh, we are very interesting in the, interested in this system. A word about the, let's say, the not the comparison, but the positioning of LDAX regarding what is uh, very soon now available, the SATCOM. Uh, SATCOM is uh, very interesting. That's something we are really considering, uh, and we're looking forward to see the first uh, the, the first test and first results of that. Uh, anyway, we have some questions or some, let's say, uh, yeah, questions uh, on the SATCOM solutions. Uh, we already have some, some several SATCOMs on board, one for packs and one for the operations. Uh, we have questions about the cost, the monopoly of one single uh, communication uh, uh, technology. So the question is LDAX, uh, is LDAX a lighter solution? Uh, is something that we are interested in. Uh, so, so that's it. So, once again, uh, very interesting by uh, by this LDAX uh, possible technology. Now, what about the questions? Um, what do we think it's uh, important uh, for the future and to be considered for LDAX? First, uh, it is essential that LDAX is adopted worldwide. Uh, as you know, uh, there has been a lot of uh, divergence uh, during the last years about communication between the EU and, and the US uh, uh, around B1, but also today B2. There does not seem to be a real convergence, perhaps a, a new divergence. We don't know. We, we will see. Uh, same thing uh, between the OSI and the IPS, even if IPS uh, it seems to be the targeted solution. Um, but as you can uh, easily understand, uh, we cannot transport one system per region in the world, uh, and let's say anymore. Um, it's already complicated to fit an aircraft with uh, so many solutions. So if the situation gets more complicated, uh, we're going to have we're going to have a problem. Uh, don't know if it's really on the pi uh, on a pipe, but uh, perhaps a satellite-based uh, LDAX complement it, so uh, would be interesting. Don't, don't really know if it's on the pipe, but uh, that's something that could be uh, interesting to in this idea of, uh, of a worldwide uh, adoption. Uh, second point is on the ground deployment. Uh, what is sure is that we need, we would need here an harmonized solution. Uh, we won't come back on the B1 uh, deployment experience. Uh, it should be coordinated by one single entity and it should also take advantage of the existing network on ground, uh, if possible. Uh, the the HNB1 uh, ground infrastructure had, has been developed. Uh, it would be a mess not to uh, take benefit of that and restart a new uh, deployment from scratch to, to our opinion. Uh, but uh, okay, we are not a ground specialist. Uh, next point is the multilink. Uh, Davide, you say the word also on the multilink. Uh, multilink is really a key. Uh, it's important uh, that we have the flexibility uh, as much as possible to choose the best link uh, for the best need. Uh, different airlines can have different needs. Uh, geographical, uh, economical, operational. So we we all are different, and we can make different choices. And it's important that the, the rules are not set uh, since the beginning, uh, because it could, of course, uh, uh, let's say, uh, prevent some airlines to invest in such a system if we are forced to use uh, such a system uh, at this condition or this condition. Uh, next point is the opportunity to rationalize and to mutualize the onboard architecture. I will say a word later on that, but it's of course um, important. Um, LDAX should also, um, yeah, in terms of uh, communication, why do we, do we need a new communication system, in fact? Uh, we don't need it just because we need it. Uh, you know, you always need the brand new iPhone, but uh, uh, do you have the application or the network or or or, or else uh, to get benefit of this? So first, uh, we have to be clear on the application uh, that will be supported. And for example, on the AT side, uh, for sure we had to clarify the B2 and the, and the B3 parameter 
to really know where could be the benefits. Uh, what is sure is that it could have for us strong benefits for the AOC and the EFB. You know, the EFB, EFB world is an open world. So I uh, was speaking about uh, the, the, the phone, uh, you know, as soon as you have a phone and, and a good uh, communication part, uh, there is no limit to IDs. Uh, so pretty sure we can use this pipe to, uh, to push some new application, uh, exchanging information between the aircraft and the ground. Um, next question about the VDL. Um, there has been some studies uh, and some discussions uh, which uh, says that uh, we should be uh, we should reach a saturation uh, sooner or later to 27 28 uh, 2030 uh, some somewhere around uh, first uh, let's say that VDL uh, we still have benefits even when FCI communication system will be available uh, VDL should be still uh, there uh, because it's uh, uh, reliable, because for short messages uh, where we need a very good response time, uh, it is there. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that uh, for short messages, we will still uh, need VDL and uh, VDL will still be the, let's say, the best uh, way for these messages. Uh, Next, uh, next uh, point for the saturation. Uh, we believe that we have some mitigation to postpone the saturation date to, to later. Uh, on AOC, uh, there are a lot of working groups uh, on the subject ongoing, and we have identified some, uh, some mitigation possible to reduce the, the report's uh, size, uh, to install perhaps new solutions that are not available today, but uh, could be uh, available in, uh, in, in the next future, because today they are not fully uh, reliable and fully, uh, let's say, operational. Uh, but uh, with the help of uh, the engine and aircraft manufacturer, we believe that we can optimize a bit uh, before 2030. On the ATN protocol, just uh, uh, just to think about this ATN protocol optimization, if possible. Uh, we know that uh, globally, as you see on the on the right, and that this is uh, Collins uh, Aerospace uh, source, um, uh, the ATN represents around 45% of the global uh, traffic over VDL. And with this 45%, uh, you can see on the right that uh, nearly 98% of the, of the message represents the protocol and the payload by itself is uh, nearly uh, around one percent so only one percent of the 45 percent uh, is uh, is used uh, for uh, for cpdlc so that's something that uh, if could be changed uh, could be very interesting and could postpone uh, the date of saturation to a longer uh, date and allow us to uh, to better prepare uh, an LDAX uh, implementation. Uh, I'm back on the opportunity to rationalize the, the avionics. Um, on, on, on the top, you know, we, we have, or the aircraft manufacturers have done also some rationalization uh, on the navigation, uh, for example, grouping the ILS and the GPS into a single box. Uh, same thing on the surveillance. Uh, you have here the GPWS, the TCAS, the radar, uh, and the transponder grouped in uh, in one single box. Well, two in fact, but uh, let's say uh, very optimized. Uh, today, on the lower part, you can see the COM architecture uh, today with three VHF, two HF, one or two PAC system, one or two SATCOM, uh, the PAX uh, SATCOM, the 4G. Uh, on the nav uh, part, we have some one, two DMEs, we've got fours, we've got uh, so many uh, systems and so many uh, antennas. Not exactly like, uh, like on the picture you can see, but uh, more and more we have some many antennas and many equipment on board to, to, um, uh, to implement the communication. If LDAX could be an opportunity to simplify all that, 
uh, at aircraft level uh, for new aircraft at line fit, uh, for example, to question the need for a, a third VHF, uh, the need for DMEs. Uh, could we implement uh, the VHF and the LDAX and perhaps the cellular into a single box? Can we integrate the PAX communication and so on? Uh, these are questions and very interesting question that could uh, be uh, uh, of strong interest for us as you can imagine because you reduce the number of boxes you reduce the number of spares you reduce the maintenance uh, burden and the maintenance cost so uh, and you and you uh, of course uh, increase the operational uh, uh, reliability so that's very interesting um, for the retrofit uh, it should be taken into account to uh, minimize uh, and to take benefits, uh, let's say, of the current aircraft installation in terms of internal uh, uh, wiring racks and so on, to take benefits of that to, to install an LDAC system. So uh, we believe that's a, that's a lot uh, we, we could do here. Other questions uh, that are, let's say, not really uh, LDAC related, but uh, a bit finally. Uh, do we still need to continue with Aeromax? Uh, we, Aeromax has been discussed since a long time now. Uh, we think that uh, there is not a lot of future for it to airport based. Uh, so uh, perhaps it could be the time now to say stop uh, and to focus on other system like LDAX uh, and to save the time for LDAX. Uh, Caesar free, that's uh, an opportunity, so that's an open question and we believe that we it should be encourage uh, LDAX demonstration, real demonstration uh, as soon as possible and to bring LDAX to V4, so for industrialization uh, in, in the best uh, uh, lead time. Um, a word on the transition period. Um, before LDAX is available, uh, or would be available, uh, and before, let's say, uh, in the next decade, uh, we have time. And the context during the next decades, uh, regarding the inv airline investment first, uh, I will not come back on the COVID uh, impact, but as you can guess, it's massive in terms of uh, investment reduction. Um, second point is that on the CNS, we have already made some huge investment on the data link with the mandate and also on the ADSB, so on the C and the S. And we have now in front of us uh, some investment uh, foreseen uh, on the navigation for SBAS and GBAS. Uh, also on the airline investments, uh, just to recall that an aircraft is not just a, a telecommunication device. We have also some uh, some seats, we have a cabin, we have some systems, we have uh, landing gears, fuel conditioning and so on, which also requires some, some, some investment. Uh, as, I, as I said previously, there is an anticipation needed uh, two, three, four years before we invest into a system. So we still have time in this uh, period to, to do some things. And last point in the investment that uh, we, we can see uh, a lot of, fleet of changes in the fleet adjustments, uh, phase out new aircraft and so on. So this is, uh, this is important. Uh, during this transition period also, uh, we need to take benefits and to fly the aircraft and take benefits of the investment we have made. Uh, already said a word about uh, the B1, uh, it's time to harmonize and to get benefits before we install a new system and, 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 and go on. Uh, we have to secure ATN and secure AOC operations. Uh, we still have the passenger uh, SATCOM, let's say it's a different subject, but uh, we have invested a lot. So we have to take benefits of this huge investment made. Um, which benefits and when? Uh, I already said a word about that. Uh, ATNB2 has to be clarified. Also with the other side of the, of the Atlantic, perhaps with uh, for airlines, uh, US airline. Uh, they have a lot of questions about that. Uh, and we need to assess the benefits of this B2 uh, before we go and before we continue. Uh, there should be, uh, uh, of course, CBAs for the for the LDAX and for the other uh, FCI, 
and we would be ready to support uh, this CBA and to uh, bring some some data to this uh, operational and airline data to this uh, FCI CBA. And of course, during this time, we will have also, also the new uh, SATCOM outcomes, the first results uh, uh, and the first uh, benefits we hope from, from this. So as you can see, uh, there are uh, years where we have to sub stabilize uh, a, a bit before we go to the next step. Uh, so that's a few years available uh, before we decide to new communication investments. But at the time uh, to take advantage of this uh, next years to accelerate the LDAX feasibility. Uh, LDAX is known since uh, years now and uh, we need to uh, accelerate and make decision. Uh, it's uh, we go or we don't go, but we need to accelerate. So that's uh, that's it for the points we we wanted to to rise uh, to conclude and to sum up. Uh, really, we support this LDAX uh, and the potential benefits it could bring. Uh, Multilink is a must, and we want to have control on this Multilink. Uh, this is a, this is a key if we want to buy this system at the end. Uh, we need to have a, a minimum of control uh, on that. LDAX should be worldwide, even if it's not a worldwide deployment, of course, but uh, uh, we have to feel that this system has a future uh, elsewhere than in Europe. The transition period uh, it could be beneficial uh, to accelerate the decisions. Uh, we need to accelerate the action and decision before time decides of LDAX future, because it could be the uh, the the result at the end uh, we have uh, by the past uh, some experience of such system that uh, were finally uh, uh, gave up uh, we have to stabilize the house before we build a nice first floor so that's, that, that's evident but that's not always uh, evident at the end so uh, uh, stabilize the current situation uh, consider opportunity to rationalize the onboard communication equipments and uh, focus the CESAR communication activity on LDAX, perhaps, uh, let's say, forget some other systems and target the V4. So the big, uh, yeah, the big uh, message we would like uh, to pass is, yes, we believe in this system on the paper, but we need to make decision uh, really as soon as possible now. So this is it for my presentation. Laurent, this is Armin. Armin Schlere again. I try to help out a little bit on this on this uh, issue here because our moderator Klaus Peter Hauf has a problems to get into the meeting. So I followed the discussion on uh, during your presentation, and there was one point uh, directly related to one of the items you mentioned. It's about AOC optimization and it came from Radek from Honeywell and uh, just read it for you. When you say VDL life can be prolonged by AOC optimization, do you think this optimization can outpace the fleet's renewal? I've heard that new aircraft send up to 10 times more AOC than old aircraft and this may grow. So yeah. the optimization would thus have to be quite huge. Maybe you can react on this. Yes, uh, about the AOC uh, offload possibilities, uh, we have identified some way to improve and it's clearly true that the new aircraft that have been delivered, uh, speaking about the, for example, the 320 NEO or all this kind of new aircraft, they generate bigger messages on the, on the AOC. Uh, these messages are mostly some engine uh, reports that are sent uh, from the aircraft without control from the airline. Oh. So we don't have any control on that. There have been designed by the engine manufacturers, uh, let's say to uh, be able to have a lot of data to analyze the, the, the engine health and provide some, uh, some alerts and some uh, guidance to the airlines uh, under uh, engine maintenance contract. So we know that these reports have been designed by the by the engine manufacturer. 
and we are trying all collectively, not uh, only airlines, but also uh, air, uh, aircraft manufacturer and, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, stakeholders who are trying to, uh, let's say, have the engine manufacturer around the table and discuss about the relevance of some reports and how they could be redu reduced. So uh, it has been started. Uh, same thing for uh, uh, aircraft manufacturer. They have also taken their part. Uh, for us also, we have taken our part. We know that we have some reports that we can customize, but not all the airlines have these capabilities and all have the tools to perform, uh, let's say, the, the setting of these rules. So as soon as we can, we try to reduce the AOC, but not, no, no, nothing is uh, under our control. Uh, let's say that, uh, I would just say that uh, AOC is not only the engine uh, data, it's, there are a lot of things under the AOC which are very operational for us. Uh, I was speaking in my presentation of short messages that are sent through VDL, that's only a couple of, uh, you know, characters, very low messages, and we believe that they, it is, uh, they are essential, uh, for example, for timestamps and so on. Uh, so we need to preserve them, but uh, you can uh, be sure that uh, at the jerk, for example, we speak about the AOC uh, offload. Uh, we are committed to reduce the volume, uh, but also to preserve this AOC because once again, it's important for us. And we hope that uh, the engine manufacturer uh, will follow uh, on, on this way. So thank you, Laurent, for this uh, immediate feedback. I think the point on, on the LDAX is, from my perspective, is really that you have a means at hand to really prioritize traffic and, and for, from the ATS perspective, which we do not have in the, in the context of the VDL mode 2. We also have do not have any control on what is going on there with respect to AOC on the link. So thank you for that. Trying to take over a little bit the task of, of Klaus Peter House. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation. There were some, uh, several times a question about the availability of slides. I guess they would be available at, at the end of the meeting somehow. We, we will, uh, I think that that should be possible. And um, there was another item, maybe just briefly, about the protocol overhead. You mentioned this, this slide from, um, which has been presented from, from Collins, I think, on the protocol overhead. I think we have to be careful in that context. It always depends on the real traffic, on the real data traffic, on the application which you have. If you do not have any real traffic, you have 100% overhead. So, so we have to be careful what, what, what the scenario is behind on, on, on that issue. And not to forget the discussion on the non-use of IDRP, which causes a, quite a lot of traffic on the link and would also save some, some bandwidth there as well on, on the VDL. Just absolutely, absolutely. And uh, yeah, as uh, yeah, the, the, the thing was to say that, okay, on the AOC, we know that AOC is systematically, uh, let's say, targeted to reduce the volume on the, on the, on the VHF. And we, okay, we, uh, we agree for that and we will try uh, to do the maximum we can do. Uh, what we're just saying uh, is that we can see that 45% uh, of the VDL is mostly all about protocol to send only a few messages, not few messages, but only, you know, 1%. <coughs> and so we don't know if it's technically possible and technically uh, the best solution, but we should uh, all together think about reducing this uh, 45% if we can. Yeah. yeah. Open the subject. Okay, so thanks again. So I tried to figure out what on the agenda where we where we are now. I think the agenda, as far as I have it here, I'm we are still. Yeah, 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 Thomas. Um, we are still on the aircraft side, aircraft deployment. So we have now seen the the perspective from from the airline. Let's say it this way, and and now we are considering more from the manufacturer, specifically related to how it can be implemented into the avionics and for this I would give the floor to Thomas Bögel from Rodan Schwarz. Thanks a lot. I'm just trying to share my screen. I hope it works because I had some some issues I've been thrown out several times. I can see your slide. I hope every Okay. Thank thank you very much. Uh, 
Thanks for the invitation here. So first a few words to my person and the company. So my name is Thomas Bögel. I'm located uh, in, in the headquarter of Roden Schwarz in Munich in Germany. And I'm in charge of new technologies and studies with uh, next generation communication uh, products, not only RF communication, but mainly RF communication in different fields, not only in the aeronautical uh, community, but also in some other communities. Uh, I have only six, seven slides, and I'm I, I'm quite happy with about what uh, what I saw from Lauren's presentation because I see we have a quite nice overlap already. So, just let's start. I will just wait a few seconds after switching the slides to give the connectivity the chance to bring the pictures on the screen. So, when we are talking about LDAX and other communication means, we have to talk about a quite simple question: Was it what is it good for? What can it what can it provide to the users? What investments do we see? And all these things. And on this slide, I just explained the idea behind the rollout strategy, which is presented in this uh, set of slides, which is by the way not new, but probably new to a few of the audience. So I'm just summing up the idea behind the LDAX rollout. And to be honest, LDAX as a technology, LDAX as such, is mainly a transparent IP capable data link with a really nice over the air bandwidth, but LDAX is not a system. So that means it doesn't provide uh, application and services compared to VDL mode 2. We still do not have any service provider, no infrastructure, therefore no customers, no customer base, no payment models. And that means this is a quite critical situation. But we saw on the on one of the first slides from Laurent in the presentation before uh, that VDL mode 2, and I'll now switch on uh, these green faces for VDL mode 2, and VDL mode 2 has everything except over the air bandwidth. So we have seen in Laurent's presentation that saturation for VDL mode 2 is a big issue. And this is the reason why we came to the idea, why not combining the LDAX RF bandwidth capability with the system capability and the system layout of VDL mode 2. And this is the basis for the current rollout strategy, which was described already in a, in a white paper from ICAO, where several people, several companies have been working together to bring this paper out and explain the ideas behind. And this is, the main idea behind the current strategy rolling out LDAX. So the idea is just enhancing the air bandwidth of VDL mode two systems. And this is asking a lot of, uh, answering a lot of questions uh, about new systems, about old system. It's not a new system. It's a new capability for a already rolled out and well-known system solving some issues we can see. And by the way, this idea is not new. It was, was uh, explained and introduced already five years ago uh, in different uh, uh, opportunities at ICAO and in some, some other conferences. And now let's look to the investment side and the user side advantages. So what we can do now is we have now here 200 times more bandwidths available compared to the VHF data link, which is significantly more than we currently see from the actual VDL motor system, including the ideas of enhanced VHF. So it is far beyond what VDL may need in the next decades. So that means we can have a minimum of investments. We have the same customer base which means we can enhance the existing business. So we have not everything completely new. So we have an add-on to existing uh, system, existing infrastructure, existing payment models, etc. And we can also add more attractive services which are not possible so far uh, due to the lack of bandwidth. And then additionally, what's coming with LDAX is this navigation capability, which is normally forgotten very often. So it's not available in VDL mode two, but it's available by nature within an LDAX communication network. And this is very important because for instance, now we have a possibility 
if we have a rolled out LDAX infrastructure and whenever the aircraft is above this infrastructure, then we have a navigation data capability in parallel, fully automatic. And the idea is to provide into the flight deck a navigation data, which is similar to DME, to keep the differences also here as small as possible, like similar in, in the situation we have with ILS and Chibas. Okay, now maybe you might, might ask, how can this work to enhance the VHF bandwidth by adding a data link which is working in a completely different frequency band? And the idea is coming from VDL mode 2 itself because they are thinking going to more than one frequency. So that means they have to implement a mechanism of scanning of channel access uh, for their own purposes already. So that means when they have learned to use more than one frequency, currently from my information, it's up to four frequencies. In that case, with the same mechanisms, the L band can be seen as the fifth frequency and significantly more, the fifth to the nth frequency. And the only thing we need, similar to VDL mode 2, is just a receiver which can scan the available channels and a transmitter which can access the available channels so we can uh, implement a channel access scheme in the same way as VDL mode 2 is doing. So we can now have an enhancement of the RF data link. And if we do doing our job well, we will have LDAX just as a new broadband mode for the RF link, which makes the investment very, very low. Now a, a picture which shows this idea in a very simplified version. So currently we have here, the blue is the VDL mode 2 infrastructure. Here we have a radio from different manufacturers. So here we have the RF link up to the aircraft. Here we have a VDL mode 2 radio, which could be based on RING 750, a data radio, one of the three radios we have seen in the presentation before. And more than one frequency here. And LDAX is just connected. I call it an LDAX adapter, an LDAX enhancement to IP with a new LDAX capable radio and in fully parallel, a new data link up to the air, into the aircraft. And we will see in the next few slides how this big question mark may look like. But with this idea, we have already a significant step ahead which says we have now a significantly improved RF data link cap capability available. So that means it, it's a completely new picture. If you look to the, uh, to the problem with the saturation of VDL mode two, it will not exist at all anymore. Saturation will not be an issue anymore. And now we can use this significantly improved data link to put on top what's not possible right now on VDL mode 2, and we could put on top additional services, additional capabilities, which may come from a uh, LDAX infrastructure. So that means it's no need that we have dedicated radios on dedicated VDL mode 2 sites. It could also uh, be a rented bandwidth from an LDAX infrastructure. But, but anyway, we have now the possibility to enhance the services by using RF bandwidths in these kind of systems. Plus, and I mentioned again, the navigation capability of LDAX, which is an embedded, more or less free of charge capability, which could be used as an APNT capability on the aircraft. I, I, I already mentioned, I, my idea is to have a DME-like data stream into the flight deck and then the flight deck has the possibility to switch either to DME coming from original DME or DME coming from LDAX, recalculated into navigation maps to the original DME locations. So no change for the flight deck. For the aircrafts, we must always, always say size, weight and power is very important. So we, we need minimum additional weight. We have to reuse existing resources wherever possible because LDAC uh, aircraft installation is significant different to the ground installation. But nevertheless, the next slide is just one slide. I have a very, very short view to the ground infrastructure where 
we have the, the advantage of these two frequency bands being offset of, by a factor of 10. So we have roughly 100 something megahertz, we have roughly one gigahertz, so this is roughly one a factor of one to 10, which makes the simultaneous operation quite easy. So you can just install a, a, an additional LDAX radio on the same site, search for a new location for the antenna, connect it to the VDL mode two infrastructure, and then you have the fifth frequency and many, many more frequencies available for your VDL mode two system. And just keep in mind, each frequency here has already the 200 times more bandwidth than each frequency on the left side. But this is not the strategy for the aircrafts because it could be a problem if we have an additional radio plus an additional antenna on board of the aircraft. And this is the, the reason why we need an alternative concept for airborne installations. And this will be shown on the next slide. And the next slide shows one of many different or several different ideas which are currently under discussion. So this is the combination of the of the most promising ideas we have, we have been discussing in the last uh, one or two years. So we, we are starting with a migration and what we currently have is a VHF antenna and a VHF data radio based on RX 750 available for different manufacturers. And now let's have a look to the migration to LDAX. And it's, it's a problem if you want to place a new antenna on the on the pressurized cabin. So the, the idea starts of reusing the antenna footprint, just replacing the VHF single band antenna by a VHF L band dual band antenna. This is already available from aircraft antenna manufacturers. So you can unscrew this antenna and put this antenna on the, the aircraft. It has the same footprint, has the same VHF capability. So we have already a, a very easy full reuse of the antenna layout. And now let's look to the radio. So the idea is just keep the RN 750 VHF radio unchanged. We have seen from Lauren's presentation that there are some ideas of combining boxes, but on the other side, a scalable rollout has also some advantages, which says leave unchanged what's running well and put on top what's new. And the optimization into less number of boxes could be a second step after that. If LDAX is rolled out, is well established part of the community, then we could talk about condensing size, weight, and power by combining boxes. But this rollout strategy is fully scalable, which says leave the current resources on the aircraft unchanged and put on top what's absolutely necessary. And you see, now we have a gap in the antenna connector because now we have uh, a dual band antenna, which provides L band frequency band down to the, to the avionics bay. But now what about the, uh, splitting up L band and uh, VHF? And this is done by the new box. So that means new boxes bring with them what they need. And the rest of the system is unchanged. So I just, uh, shown here a diplexer, which is just feeding back to the L, to the VHF radio the previous VHF signal and the attenuation on VHF, which is by the way a quite low frequency band, is expected to be low than 2 dB. I think this is affordable in the link budget, and normally you wouldn't see any uh, consequence if you have. Uh, a, a slightly longer antenna cables and the diplex in between. And now we have the LDAX box as a separate box. And we have been discussing to have a combination of both. And the combination of both has advantages, but it has some disadvantages. And some disadvantage is that if, for instance, take out this RN 750 radio and put in a dual box, then I have some constraints with power supply and power dissipation, which means we cannot transmit L-band and VHF at the same time due to inrush current, uh, the dimension of the fuses and power dissipation. So that means we can have a simultaneous reception, but not a simultaneous transmission. This is solved here. And the other disadvantage is I mentioned that LDAX is able to provide 200 times more bandwidth to the users. But the currently used interfaces on RN750 are not is not able to 
to, to root this high amount of data. And this leads to this enhanced idea where we say, okay, RING 750 VDL mode 2 is completely unchanged. So we might have an RING 429 bus or something similar. But LDAX, due to the 200 times more data throughput, needs a high, high throughput interface, which could be AFDX with IPS on top. And it could be also of an advantage if we still connect to the RING 429. For instance, we have the possibility to coordinate with NVIDIA LMO2. And we have the possibility to monitor the DME settings and have DME operation possible and fully supported by this new box. Now we have two separate interfaces and the new one is connected for the new bandwidths, <coughs> one of the higher bandwidths from, from LDAX and RN 429 remains unchanged, uh, which is a, a very attractive idea, uh, scaling up existing VDL mode 2 approach by reusing the current existing and installed resources and just put on top what's absolutely necessary for new capabilities. So that means we have two boxes on one single antenna, full reuse of existing antenna position with identical footprint. Uh, the VDL mode 2 part is completely unchanged, very important. And the new box with LDAX brings what it needs. It brings the diplexer, it brings a new bus connection, and it has the option we are thinking about is still connect to, I call it the VDL bus, which is not uh, correct, but it's easy uh, to explain here. So I connect to the RN429 to have the possibility to have an easy coordination between existing VHF mode and enhanced L-band mode. This is my last slide already, summarizing the key facts of this idea. And I think it is very important to, to keep the VDL radios unchanged, at least for the first few years until LDAC starts rolling out. The antenna for VHF is replaced by a dual band antenna with the same footprint. So no change on the pressurized cabin. A new LDAC traded avionics bay. This is the price we have to pay, but I think this is a feasible way forward. The antenna cable is first fed to the LDAX box and then fed back to the VHF radio. For this, the LDAX box will come with a diplexer. And the LDAX radio is connected to the high speed bus, fully separated, open up the high bandwidth 200 times more than VHF. And in parallel, connected to the existing buses to ensure an easy coordination and an easy scalable scalability to the new capabilities. And it's also important that VHF band and L band are usable fully simultaneously for VDL mode two. So the V is outdated. It's, it's not VHF anymore. In that case, it's L band, but okay, it's a well-known abbreviation. But now we have a lot of uh, advantages by a simultaneous use of VHF and L-band. For instance, the L-band will provide also the, the navigation capability, which will be always running. And we can, we can have uh, a simultaneous use in two bands. And now with the last statement coming back to the saturation for VF, VHF uh, for VDL mode 2, there will be no saturation anymore. Because whenever an LDAX infrastructure is available, the protocols will ensure that we go to L-band first to have the opportunity, opportunity to use the 200 times higher bandwidths. And this will use to automatically move to the higher frequency band. It will automatically uh, lead to a deload of the VHF band uh, as, as currently used for VDL mode two. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm open for questions. So I go back from the presentation mode so I can see what's going on on the screen. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Böbel. I try to follow the, the questions on our question list here. And there was one uh, dealing with the transparent or how the LDAX VDL combination is perceived by the user. And it was just a question from, from Radik. Uh, from a multi-link perspective, I guess it is seen as a single link, right? 
It's really transparent. It's, it's not a new link showing up like that. We can, we can do that, to operate it as a single link, but we are not fixed to that. So we, what we could do, we can virtually split the LDAX bandwidth into one part for VHF acting as a single link VHF L band, but we could also use the other part of the bandwidth to establish any new link. So it's up to us okay. how many links virtually will be represented by the, by the RF bandwidth of uh, LDAX. Okay, thank you. So as we are running late, we're running late. and um, I would suggest that we go on this late next presentation. Thanks, Armin, Thanks, first of Armin, all, for, for helping, helping me out because we have a technical, technical issue. issue. We have and quite an echo from, from you coming from you. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, so the uh, next one so on the on list of speakers is Gary Lawton. He is from CDI on the aircraft and will provide, will provide support to help us to help ground deployment and transition. And, 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 and the outlook to help us 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 to help Hi there, everyone. I hope you can uh, see my slides. Can someone give me a nod to let me know that it's working? It's working, Gareth. Fine. Excellent. Hi. I'm not sure if you uh, heard Klaus Peter's introduction there, but I'm Gareth Lawton. I'm a product manager working on ATC products for CETA. And I'm going to talk to you about possible opportunities to deploy LDAX from a CSP perspective, but I think we'll touch on some, some, wider, some wider areas here. Um, so moving on. So we don't want to cover too much of what was in the previous uh, first two presentations, but just as a very quick recap of why we need a, a new data link service in the first place. Firstly, we've got new uh, ATC features coming down the line, largely trajectory based operations based. And we see that these are going to use between two and four times the bandwidth of the conventional CPDLC we have today. Then, as someone mentioned in the questions, we have new aircraft types coming down the line. These, we see typically that a new generation of aircraft uses about four times the AOC bandwidth of the previous ones, not quite as much as 10, but quite a lot more. Um, and then, you know, it's a bit hard to imagine this now when we're all suffering from low traffic, but uh, from 2024 onwards, we expect the 2019 levels to come back and then grow quite sharply from there. So those things add up to a lot of demand in the future. So you will have heard other people mention multi-link during the, during the slides. I think uh, this is also a focus of CETA. We're very much keen to make sure that our strategy is multi-link. And by this, we mean that there's multiple routes between the air and the ground, both terrestrial and non-terrestrial, i.e. SATCOM. And we think these come with some benefits. Well, we think these do come with some benefits. Um, Firstly, the obvious one of redundancy. So if route A isn't there, you've got route B or route C or maybe even route D to choose from. Then you've, the customer can choose the route that best provides the balance of cost versus uh, performance. And then lastly, we think if you've got multiple routes, it's very likely that something evolves where you are routing data of type A down route one and data of type B down route two for various different reasons. Um, so yeah, just to say multi-link is, is going to be a big thing going forward and we're fully, fully supportive of that. Um, so why LDAX as an alternative? So LDAX fits on the terrestrial side of things. The performance is something people have mentioned before, at least 50 times the video mode two bandwidth plus low latency at the same time. And then we see the fact that uh, LDAX being on a, a totally different band, it doesn't interfere with our current VDR mode two operations. So we can deploy it in the same area and even on the same ground station without any worry about conflicts or interference. Um, LDAX has prioritization in it, so we can prioritize messages over each other. This is particularly relevant if we're talking about ATC and AOC. Then we have security, um, we have encryption on LDAX. And then lastly, 
some of the things that other people touched on as well going further down the roadmap we bring in things like digital voice navigation surveillance and that can all be done with the LDAX that we roll out on day one so it's a sort of future ready solution so when we're talking about the costs of a potential LDAX deployment uh, there are sort of three main areas to consider firstly you've got the service cost and that is what the customers are paying a service provider like CETA to provide the service then you've got the initial changes needed to the ground network here we have to bear in mind that the ground network is quite extensive we have the obvious ground routing centralization parts but there's also around while well, CETA itself has around 250 VDL stations in Europe and of course we're not the only service provider um, and then you've got of course the airborne uh, equipage we see something like 12,000 uh, commercial aircraft in Europe and you can reach 80% of the flights with something like 6,000 aircraft so when you're looking at the total number it's clear that whatever you charge for the ground network changes and the airborne changes gets multiplied by quite big numbers and ends up being at the bulk of the cost so with that in mind um, it brings us on to our strategy now there have been ideas about deployment before but they had some drawbacks the first of these is that they all assumed that we would be in an IP world uh, and that all the aircraft and all the ground equipment would, uh, would be IP ready now of course we know that that's probably going to be a bit more gradual in reality then there was the ground network um, previous models had a sort of big bang mode where you had no LDAX deployment on the ground and then you suddenly had full LDAX deployment on the ground Realist in a real world we understand that different NSPs are going to move at different speeds and different geographies have different requirements so we don't think that's very likely to happen and then lastly the avionics model was quite a one-size-fits-all I call it um, in that it was very aimed at forward fit and didn't really seem to be uh, a very cost-effective model for a retrofit so with all those things in mind what CETA has been working on is something called the LDAX transition concept or LTC for short and it has some differences so the first thing um, is that it we try to support both the legacy equipment on the ground and the air and an IP infrastructure at the same time to allow for sort of a gradual transition between the two uh, next because we're going to make use of existing infrastructure we can target that uh, that rollout to specific geographic regions uh, one at a time and then gradually scale up rather than a model where we just throw out throw LDAX to, to the world in one go and then lastly because we're making use of that existing infrastructure um, we can keep the cost down both on the air and in the ground um, so if I talk about how we do this um, if you look at what we have today um, you see the CETA ground station there it has a radio in it and it has a box called a VGC which manages the radio and then we've got the the ground network which is doing routing and processing and then we've got the ANSP customer DLFEP sat here um, connected to NSPs and, and AOC so what we're proposing to do is to add an LDAX ground radio uh, like the one Thomas showed you in his presentation and the gateway box to some of the ground stations and I stress that we can do this for two ground stations 10 ground stations or 100 ground stations it's it's fully scalable um, and then what I'm showing here in green is what uh, what might be a good fit for retro fit so what we do is we tr suggest that we leave the, C the CMU as it is we continue with the ARINC 429 bus and then we add uh, a radio which uh, we, we replace the video mo 2 radio with a combined LDAX and video mo 2 radio as, as Thomas mentioned in his presentation whether the radio is one radio or two radios is something that's still being debated but from the principle of what I'm showing here it doesn't really change very much um, because this is a retrofit uh, legacy aircraft it's still sending OSI ACARS data down to us we take that in our ground radio we push it through the gateway and then on to our legacy uh, existing ground system so you see with this mode um, with a very low upfront cost we can get LDAX off the ground um, by keeping the changes on the avionics and the ground minimal, as minimal going forward um, we're now 
starting to talk about the LDAX that we all foresee going forward. Here we have an, an aircraft that is IP compliant. We're going to be using the new bus. And uh, something that I didn't mention before is that with IP, you get a, a more advanced version of multi-link, whereas you can only do a more simple one with the green model above. So what we're trying to stress here is to make a, a, a pragmatic approach where we can where we can have these two modes and use those to gradually transition. Transition, I think, is the key here um, between where we are now and the full function, full fat option we want to see in the future. Um, a, a quick word about organization. Um, now, by the time that we are looking at deploying LDAX, there should be something in place called the European DSP. Some of you will already be involved with that and some of you won't. Um, basically, this is an organization that sits between CSPs like CETA and air navigation service providers. Um, the point of raising this slide um, is really only to say that the model that we are suggesting would work with or without the DSP. With the DSP, the LDAC service would be provided to the DSP and without the DSP, the LDAC service would be provided to NSPs in the way that, and, the, and AOC in the way that we do with VHF today. Okay, moving on to the last slide, which is about timeline. So you'll see some green times and some blue times. So what we plan to do between now and 2023 is to develop the ground infrastructure and the ground radio and integrate that into our system. Uh, we're going to collaborate with Frequentis um, in order to help us um, make some ground equipment that we can put into our network. And then in 2024, we plan to do some validations um, lab-based validations and then later on in that year in still in 2024 we plan to validate um, this this concept on our full operational equipment and all these times are designed to get everything prepared for the first phase of the FCI future communication infrastructure road deployment roadmap which has a targeted core area being deployed with LDAX and some 300 aircraft. And then as you see, as we progress through the years on from that, we we scale up to where we eventually have a, uh, a full a full quote and full coverage in Europe of, of LDAX. Okay, uh, that's all I was planning to say. I mean, basically the, the gist of the presentation here is, you know, in order to deploy LDAX successfully, we think we have to do it cost effectively and realize that this needs to be a gradual and and careful transition. Thanks very much. Thanks, Gareth. So get us an outlook on um, CSP planning. Um, I would suggest to go straight forward to the next presentation from Rick, also to save some time. But before doing so, I will answer one quick question. Will the recordings be available? And uh, because someone have to leave soon, yes, all recordings, the question and the answers will, and the presentations will be made available on the SGU website uh, just a few days after the event. So Rick, uh, can you just go on? Thanks, Klaus Peter. I can. Good afternoon. Good morning to everyone. I will just share my screen. There we go. Hopefully, just let me know if there's an issue with seeing this or with the sound. Hopefully, I don't end up speaking to myself. That's not getting bigger. There we go. Hopefully everybody can still see that. Uh, so as I say, uh, good afternoon and good morning from me. I'm uh, Ricardo de Souza from Nats, um, and I work on uh, CNS future strategic topics at Nats, and uh, have also taken part in many of the, uh, the the European Common projects on data link in the last few years. So uh, one of those is this is our work developing LDAX at the moment. So that's why I've come to present the, the ANSP view, ANSP perspective of the LDAX deployment. And before I start, I should say thank you to uh, some ANSP colleagues from DFS, MUAC and NIDE who helped me put together the, uh, the presentation I'm going to give now. So in by way of an agenda, uh, the structure of the uh, of the presentation really is a set of questions. So what questions would an NSP ask uh, about the LDAX deployment and have been asking already? 
Um, and these fall for me into three categories. So we have the technical aspects, the uh, service provision aspects, and a more strategic aspect, which is almost kind of a conclusion, things to consider as we go forward um, in planning deployment. So from the technical side, I'll talk about what ATC operations will LDAC support. Very important question, so more about the why, the benefit. Uh, also talk about what the technical, ch uh, technical changes to uh, required at the NSP level to integrate LDACs. Uh, services. Uh, also importantly, how fit for the future is LDAX? We don't want to deploy something that in two or three years time we already have to think about replacing or improving. On to the service, uh, service provision sort of aspects. How much will LDAX cost for ANSPs? Very, very important question. Uh, what will the service model be? So how will that be delivered to ANSPs and other end users? And also, can LDAX be integrated into a DSP? Gareth introduced this a little bit in the presentation just now. I'll expand a little bit, not too much about the DSP itself, as that is a whole topic on its own, but about the benefits of uh, using a DSP potentially uh, for that purpose. Uh, and the more strategic, forward-looking view. So what are the timescales and challenges uh, for transition to LDAX? Uh, how does LDAX fit into the uh, future communications infrastructure framework? So how does it fit in the the full set of technologies that we're investing for the future. Uh, what can be done to accelerate the provision of LDAX? Really an open question. I won't say too much about that apart from ask the question. Um, and what level of avionics and equipage uh, can we expect? And what are the timescales for that? And I'll talk about aligning roadmaps and so on. That's a very important point. So that's the, um, that's the introduction. And the first point here is around what operations are uh, uh, due to be uh, supported. By the, um, by the technology. And the first one here is to support, uh, starting the top left here, to support the CP1 uh, implementing rule that's gonna come in uh, over the next few years. And that brings with it the, uh, the I4D uh, concepts and into the uh, time-based uh, operations or trajectory-based operations, sorry, uh, which includes the ADSC uh, functionality. So that will bring with it uh, the need for performance improvements, but also on the networks, but also the increase in data traffic as ADSC is also added to CPDLC across the networks. Sorry, I missed one on the left-hand side here, which is the data link implementing rule, not to be forgotten, but is ongoing and uh, will continue to be important. And the CPDLC usage as it is when the traffic returns will continue to grow uh, from the ATC side as well. Uh, jumping over to the top right, advanced CPDLC. So we talk about an RCP 130, which in itself is a different performance standard, uh, but also brings with it uh, additional messages, additional capabilities for CPDLC linked to TBO in the long run. And again, it's all about the data traffic increasing, increasing across these networks that we're expecting uh, from an NSP side. Uh, over on the right, we have an improvement in security, which will become ever more important for the uh, ANSPs. Uh, and the, uh, the encryption and authentication across the links uh, that LDAX will provide will be uh, something very important in the future. The uh, policies around that are growing all the time. Uh, we look also to future operations where we talk about RCP60 and RSP60. Uh, I have to say the operations and the uh, applications um, associated with that are not yet clear. Uh, they're being developed um, as well. However, I do understand that uh, through the development and validation of LDAX, it will be validated against what we know so far about RCP60, RSP60, which again makes it very fit for the future about where we want to go um, uh, performance-wise. The bottom right's already been touched upon in, in the uh, other presentation, so the fact that from the off, uh, as far as I understand, there will be uh, the possibility of a navigation capability um, for from LDAX, and with the, with the um, with the consideration that most um, aircraft, uh, especially larger aircraft at the moment, use a multi-sensor uh, navigation capability in terms of uh, their position fixing on the aircraft itself, it should be uh, straightforward and it should be possible to just integrate the LDAX signaling, the LDAX messaging as an additional uh, nav source in complement to the uh, DME, GPS, and the other uh, sources we have now. So that will again be a very useful synergy that we can make use of. At uh, the bottom there, improved performance, speed and prioritization. I think Armin touched on the prioritization, which is very important. So we can prioritize the safety critical data uh, flows across that network, which we don't have currently. The bandwidth here, 
uh, an improvement in bandwidth. I think uh, um, Thomas touched on that. I've said here 50 times. I think that is that is the the stated um, improvement through the Cesar work anyway. 50 times the bandwidth over VDL, but it's a very very large improvement. What VDL can do. Um, and the improvement in the airspace coverage there is really touching on something that uh, Thomas was also talking about, which is the better management or the, the, the improved management of frequencies and uh, cell sizing and so on for LDACs, which allows much more flexibility if done correctly. I guess we have to point that out. Uh, if done correctly, allows for better sighting, more flexible sighting, um, and therefore um, a more improvement in, in coverage, but also redundancy of coverage, which is also very, very important for safety critical applications. So that's just a, a kind of a selection of the operations that uh, I think LDAX we can expect to support in the future. Uh, now we talk about the integration of LDAX. So one of the key drivers here, as we said, on the, I think it's been said on the aircraft side, same on the ground side, we need a seamless integration into the existing ANSP data link interfaces. So the way essentially the holes in the wall that we get uh, through our uh, um, uh, control centers at the moment where we receive data link services, we need that to be as plug and play as possible. It's a horrible term, but, but essentially that uh, LDAX doesn't cause any um, changes internally to the, uh, to the NSP architectures. So just to um, uh, illustrate this very quick diagram, so we're NSPs largely very broadly have an FTP connected to a data link end system, then connected to a ground ground router for ATN services. There's this boundary, on the other side of that boundary, there's another ground ground router from a provider, an air ground router to connect to the aircraft, and then the air ground infrastructure, and I've, I've made it quite uh, abstract there. So air ground one, air ground two, that's where we're looking at future uh, different technologies. And one of those is the LDAX infrastructure there. So what I've said here is the expectation is this side of the boundary to the left, there'll be no change. So that is the domain within the within the NSP, and that's what we expect and, uh, and need really, obviously, for cost efficiency and for complexity. So uh, what we get for the LDAX infrastructure here in terms of uh, integration in that, on that side is that the air ground network coverage uh, should be sustainable, the, the coverage we need, we have now, should be sustainable with a similar number of uh, sites as it is for VDL today, because the, uh, the station range, as I understand, is uh, similar uh, from an RF perspective as VDL. So again, that, that gives us a cost um, uh, consideration. Uh, it's possible reuse of ANSP technical sites for co-location. Um, and by that, I mean, we can reuse um, not only, as, as, as Gareth was saying, the, um, the existing VDL sites because of the difference in frequencies that we're using, but also the idea that we can use uh, strategic sites that ANSPs currently use for things like voice, VHF voice, that are already managed by the, by the NSPs themselves to the high level that we do. And therefore, we can make use of those potentially to site further LDAX infrastructure. And I've said there in brackets, uh, that creates a stronger relationship or needs a stronger relationship with NSPs. And that essentially means that, so it could be that um, there are more relationships from a provider for NSPs to manage those sites with the LDAX infrastructure uh, co-located. And again, that gives us potential for uh, improved cost um, aspects. Uh, and the bottom one there about the navigation function once again. So the deployments should complement DME networks. As I said on the aircraft, uh, I'm hoping there is a, a, a seamless way that the uh, LDAX signals can be added to the uh, uh, nav sources that the aircraft will use. Therefore, the deployment can be done in a coherent way along with DME. So in some way, adding LDAC sites uh, to DME sites, maybe re re replacing some over time. Uh, obviously, we have a 24-7 operation. That's very important to maintain the coverage throughout the transition period. So for the NAV site, I think there's some opportunities there. Uh, moving on to the service and cost and service model. So the, the first part there on the service model, there are some options. I think Goretti actually introduced these in the last presentation. So we can uh, expect that potentially uh, there can be some direct deployment or provision by ANSPs, as there is today for some VDL uh, networks. Uh, the delivery or deployment through, I said current CSPs, but it could be a provider, more likely, as we've already heard that Gareth's um, uh, forward thinking uh, from the CETA side, that it's likely the current CSPs will have an interest there. And also the third point, the centralized deployment, so the provision through the DSP, that I'll touch on a little bit um, uh, in the next slide. Uh, the cost, uh, it's a very important point. I can't give too much detail here, unfortunately, as I don't think there is any, but uh, to share, I think what I'd say there is that there is an ongoing um, uh, 
very wide collaborative, many stakeholder involved activity uh, managed by your control at the moment, which is an FCI business case, which I know takes into account all the needs of all the stakeholders with all the technologies involved. And in that process, which I think is due to run for the rest of this year, we should get some some better ideas of what the costs will be and, and uh, cost efficiencies that are possible and some sort of deployment um, roadmap for that. So that's, that's going to be very, very important. Um, it's dependent on the implementation option for each ANSP. So it's obviously open for each ANSP to deploy in the way they wish, uh, but it's likely to be um, managed as a, or, or the cost increases and likely to be a delta on the existing data link contracts that we currently um, manage in some way, which will make it much easier to manage. Um, and at the, the bottom there, just a need to focus on the initial deployment cost. So it's not just the ongoing in-service costs that we're talking about. There will obviously have to be some investment done up front to uh, industrialize, to, to deploy initially uh, before services are switched on and, and paid for by the users. So this is really something we, we can't forget and, and how to fund that, how to manage that in the, uh, just to get the thing off the ground. So just some important points to, to cover from an MSP side. And then some points here on DSP. As I say, I, I think hopefully it's 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 a known um, uh, known initiative by everybody on the call. Um, I'll give you a, a bit quick run through of what it means, but I don't want to talk about the DSP too much. But really, is the benefits of having a DSP to manage uh, maybe LDAX deployment transition. So that's what this slide is about. Talking here at the top about the NSP users, multiple users as NSPs. From there, the DSP is the focal point providing the service to those ANSPs. Behind the, the, the DSP from the ANSP side are all the VDL networks, SAT networks, other air ground networks that may be connected to um, a, a common backbone for ATN. And one of those would be the LDAX networks or network um, in there. So in that way, very seamless, very um, single threaded for the ANSPs whereby we, we, we would um, take a service from the DSP and the DSP would just add that LDAX element to the services that they offer over time. So the benefits to deployment and service of having such a, such a, you know, a common entity would be uh, harmonized, um, certified, importantly, DLS deployment and service. So in the ongoing sort of runtime service, it will be a certified service being provided for the NSP. Um, there would be a harmonized procurement and transition for the users. And I mean that the DSP would be available to, on behalf of the uh, ANSPs, manage the procurement and manage the, the transition that we talked about for, uh, uh, for LDAX added to VDL in, in combination with the multi-link environment with the other technologies. The, in some way, the, well, in, a, in a strong way, the DSP would take that uh, on board on behalf of the NSPs to manage. Uh, a minimized service cost and efficient deployment. So by that, I mean, I talk about the deltas on the contracts that we already have. Obviously, it's simplified if each NSP just has a single contract with a DSP. The DSP manages that uh, additional cost most efficiently on a pan-European level, also important to point out. From the, from the in, uh, initiation of the DSP, there's an idea that there will be a user pays principle, sort of a proportional costing uh, for each of the services that the DSP will run. That being the case, the integration of LDAX then automatically becomes an easier thing to take for the ANSPs um, in the long run in terms of cost. The shared deployment cost, very important as well, that there would be a, a much easier way to, to manage that mechanism for the deployment and a simplified end-to-end -end service validation. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the idea for the DSP is that it carries with it um, a fully featured, let's say, test platform uh, for data link end-to-end -end, uh, validation. So ideally there, much of the validation work that would have to be done for LDAX and so on uh, with the end-to-end -end, uh, featuring ANSP networks, a lot of that would, would be done by the DSP uh, in advance of connecting out to the ANSP. So those are the benefits I see of using a DSP potentially as, a, as an option for transition. And then into the transition side of things, here, um, this, is, this, this slide really can be seen as a conclusion for, for the points I've raised here. Uh, and they're really questions for the future, questions that need to be worked through now in the next years uh, to make sure that the, uh, the, the service is provided in a cost-effective way, in a way that, uh, so a no-break service, we can't have the data link service breaking in any way during the transition, um, and in the most um, harmonized way possible, obviously, data link is a, a pan-European service in Europe, a pan-European service by nature, really. So it has to be done in a pan-European way uh, for best results, I think. 
So there's a, a strong need for a roadmap which aligns the airborne equipage and ground adoption um, aspects together so that we can, I think that gives us the confidence that each player, so the ground can understand what the airborne is, what expect from the airborne side, the airborne side can uh, understand what's expected from the ground and the two can move along together in terms of investment at least. Um, the plan to stimulate airborne equipage in order to realize these operational benefits that I talked about before. So the operational benefits obviously rely on the fact that we have a population of aircraft that are equipped. So without that, we can't take advantage of that LDAX, uh, the LDAX benefits that we talked about. Um, LDAX needs to be seamlessly integrated into multi-link concepts. These are more strongly being talked about now. How do the technologies work together? How do the services uh, switch between the technologies? LDAX needs to be part of that and needs to be uh, compatible with that. Um, also needs to be seamlessly integrated into a future service model. Touched on that, where the, the thought about the DSP is a good way of doing that. Um, there's a note here on the DSP about alignment for planning. So planning can change, but at the moment, there's an uh, expectation that the DSP should be available by 2023, offering services by 2025. And then if you look at the ATM master plan, LDAX is due to be delivered 27 to 28. So if those timelines are followed, uh, that, that follows then the DSP is available to, to do those or to run those functions in transition that I was talking about before. So that's what we have so far. Um, we also need mature LDAX transition planning. So to understand, so Gareth, uh, especially in his presentation, provided a view of what, uh, what could be a way of deploying LDAX um, from the CETA perspective, of course. So we need to have a, a mature, coherent transition plan in place so that we can all follow. Um, LDAX needs to be part of the FCI uh, discussion, as all the other technologies need to be uh, brought into focus as well. And this is just a, a reminder of what the FCI, what I mean by the FCI. So we're talking about the various technologies that they could be more than those, but I think they're the ones that are considered again in the CESAR context. So Aeromax at the airport side, I know we talked about decisions around Aeromax, Aeromax but it's still there. Uh, video mode 2 uh, plus LDAX for the continental side from the terrestrial um, infrastructure side and then SATCOM uh, encompassing the whole thing with the you know the uh, the breadth of coverage that a SATCOM can provide uh, on a global scale uh, but also being most important currently in the oceanic context moving into the continental so that's uh, what I was going to present uh, so thank you very much for listening and if there's any questions Thanks, Rick. I'd like to ask one question uh, in particular to you and to the ANSP colleagues, but also to the aircraft operators and the SDM. Uh, Thomas Buchanan asked a question, uh, what is this uh, extended um, bandwidth LDAX will bring worse for, meaning what applications we will run on that, which is on top of the CBDLC, which more or less replicates today's voice communication. So what, what's your expectation in this respect? That is a, that's a long question, a long answer. Uh, and I know we did a lot of this sort of thinking around uh, putting together assumptions for the capacity study that the SDM were, were coordinating uh, a couple of years ago now. So the, the expectation is, everything being well, that obviously we have CPDLC now uh, at the B1 level. That is, is growing. So again, uh, the current data traffic uh, levels accepted. So that will in itself grow as ANSPs become more confident, more, more used to, 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 to the use of CPDLC in, in more, um, uh, more, uh, more operations, more occasions. Uh, more aircraft are still being equipped all the time with CPDLC, so that will grow organically. Then we bring in the, uh, the, the towards the end of the 20s, uh, we'll have ADSC added to that, and we know that they are longer messages as well as uh, additional messages to the um, uh, to the network. And we know that we're trying to put together a kind of an ADSC server to reduce the air ground demand uh, for ADSC. But the idea is that we grow. Uh, the, uh, the the need to capture that data from the aircraft because it comes useful from from takeoff really to landing for aircraft. So the coverage grows, therefore the amount of data grows. Um, so that increases the uh, the traffic. Then when you move into your trajectory based operations, in addition to the downlink data, the intentions there that I know we've been talking about um, in some forums is that uh, CPDLC changes from being uh, a tool that you can use for kind of discrete clearances for aircraft to, to as you say to, to mimic the routine uh, voice calls it switches to a, a tool whereby you can connect uh, uh, some clearances together and essentially uplink changes to trajectories 
on the aircraft rather than give discrete clearances kind of the one or two minutes down the line. So when that, when that starts to happen, uh, you can see that the, 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 the size of the data and the amount of the data will grow uh, across those networks. And, and that, that's the sort of growth that we're expecting outside of obviously the shared AOC data as well that we talked about. So in the background, as Radek, I think, had the question and was answered by, um, uh, by uh, Thomas or by uh, Laurent. Um, that is growing in the background as well, and and I think the, the forecasts for that are quite um, stark, <laughs> maybe in the future. So all those things together, uh, we need the bandwidth. So let me forward this question also to Laurent. Maybe he can elaborate a little bit. Uh, what is the aircraft operators for you? What do you intend to use this additional bandwidth for? Laurent, still online? It seems that now other ones yeah, have yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, sorry, got a problem with my, with my mic. Uh, yeah, well, uh, as I said in my presentation, clearly the the the, the use of the bandwidth uh, is um, is clear on the AOC and especially on the EFB side. Uh, you know, as soon as you have a pipe uh, established between the aircraft and the ground, you, you can uh, imagine things uh, possible with the, for example, with the EFB, moving some uh, things that are currently transmitted in a very simple way uh, through the VHF uh, uh, on, on the pipe uh, much more uh, efficient. Uh, I can speak, for example, of uh, weather forecast uh, live uh, in the cockpit or uh, flight optimization. Or fuel optimization so uh, there could be a lot of ideas and um, you know as soon as you have the media and the uh, and the available bandwidth uh, you, you you can uh, imagine a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, uh, possibilities thanks Laurent and having a, a data comp back, background myself my experience is if bandwidth is available it will be used sooner than later so so Gareth what is, is that can you share this experience as well as the CSP Yes, yeah, there, was, there were a few numbers in my slides. So firstly, to quantify the AOC point that Lauren made, we see that as about four times the data for each new aircraft generation. And for the use of the new ATC services like TBO, uh, we see that as about two to four times. Then you have to take into account lots of things that we don't really understand too well. But uh, some, you know, there, there are questions about some of the UAM use cases, well, will they be something in the future that joins this network? Nobody knows that, of course, but uh, certainly I think there are there are plenty of reasons why this why we need more than we do have now by many, you know, not just 10% more, we need many times more, I think. So, uh, yeah, I think there's not a huge amount of argument against that at the moment. I think most people would accept that uh, we need to do something. Exactly when we need to do it is, is one of the things that gets debated a lot, but certainly we need to do something. Thanks, Karis. Uh, coming to a different topic, Armin, you may uh, assist me a little bit because uh, as I was busy to reconnect with my technical issues, I'm not sure what question was addressed already. Uh, did you talk about the um, VDL plus LDAX issues uh, raised by Radek uh, asking yes, yes. that's discussed okay let's see what other questions are not touched right now so it's not so much as last time I'm a little bit surprised that it's about that I tried to answer some of them already <laughs> I noted you don't that mind. I noted that uh, yeah, coming coming to another question before we conclude here. Um, you know, it's all answered. No, I don't see any open questions right now. I mean, do you have one on your list? Not yet answered. I, I think there was one. I guess it was from one friend more about the 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 the, the so from Yata that there is a clarification needed on the spectrum compatibility with LDAX. There's, there's still an open issue. There were some tests, I guess, in the past, but there's still 
uh, some more work to be done. Uh, the technical performance need to be clarified and the use cases need to be clear first. But with respect to the use cases, I would say, uh, going from VDL mode two to LDAX is a little bit like from in the past, when you recall it, when we had ESDN and then we started to use DSL, the application will show up again then when you have the when you have the bandwidth availability. There's no doubt from my side. So uh, I, I I don't. It's it's always a little bit dangerous to ask for 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 use cases. You know you know you know when when you are dealing with modern systems when when the car was invented, nobody really had a requirement for it. That's what what I'm always saying. So I think to have more bandwidth that. Uh, uh, Gives us more opportunity to do more automation in our in the ATM environment, and and that's needed for the future, and also to make the system more safe better than we have it today, with respect to the, our analog voice. System. I think that that brings us to the same topic as we are just discussing. I, I also yeah. remind uh, the audience on. Uh, um, a phrase uh, Bill Gates one take 640 kilobit is sufficient for a PC. We all know it's not anymore, and uh, if we need if we need uh, bandwidth, it will be used. So, Davida, from your side as the regulator and having a little bit also the the overview for as an SDM, uh, does this match uh, your expectations and uh, your forecasts uh, with the capacity study? Do we need this bandwidth? Yes, for sure, uh, if we will have uh, more bandwidth that will be available, for sure it will help uh, and it will support the introduction of more uh, data link services at the end. Um, what we have today for TPO, for example, is just IDSC with uh, EPP, that is just one, uh, the first step towards the full implementation of TPO. And it is clear that at the end, the more bandwidth means also the possibility to interact uh, a lot among the different machines on ground and on board. And for sure also automation will, uh, will receive uh, benefits for that. In my opinion, we are just at the beginning because again, we have just a few services uh, already implemented about ATMV1. We have just one the first step at towards CBO, so at the end it would be beneficial at the end. I wanted to add a, a little bit of a comment in here in that when we talk about whether we need this bandwidth, uh, the we in that sentence is is a is a is a variable. There are obviously places within Europe or places in the world where we is a little earlier than others. Um, of course, if you're in a very congested area, you might well want LDAX to come along much quicker than if you're somewhere where VDMO2 is not particularly congested. Um, I see some questions also about whether whether LDAX allows you to retire VDMO2 um, one day possibly, um, but I think uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of VDMO2 out there at the moment and that's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, but in theory, the whole point of multi-link is to provide multiple, the network itself will provide customers with multiple choices and the ANSP and the airlines flying in that area should be able to get together and decide which which technologies they want to have in their geography. Um, that's where we're trying to, we're trying to get towards a menu like system where people can choose uh, which of these technologies they want. And uh, hope that's the, that's the, the golden future we're working towards, but uh, you know the legacy stuff is not going to go away anytime soon. Yeah, I think we can all agree on that. VDL mode two will be around for many, many years, most likely decades, uh, because uh, it's it's more an opportunity for forward fits and for retrofit uh, to go for new technologies. Because retrofit, as Laurent pointed out, is really really expensive and uh, it's it's understood that aircraft operators will avoid that as much as possible nevertheless saying that we are also aware that the vision for europe is the european digital sky and this needs a capable uh, data infrastructure which most likely even more than a, than a single capable trunk and satcom can for sure and will for sure also play a, a role in a multi-link environment do you share this view 
Yes, is the short answer. <laughs> I, I would not ask Rick because I have seen this on his slide anyhow. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just writing out a reply to Bart actually, his question around uh, satellite and, and it's yes, absolutely. It, the satellites and terrestrial systems both have advantages and disadvantages that we need to use together. That's that's um, uh, part of the mix in the future, technologies that we need, high bandwidth mix. Davide, is this is also something which is on the uh, European roadmap? What we can say is that for sure we are looking for this type of, uh, let me say, long time frame deployment for sure. And uh, I'd like also to support uh, the discussion that we had also before related to the need to have a deployment plan that will consider the real needs of the users at the end. It's clear that uh, Europe is not the same everywhere and the world is not the same everywhere. So it's uh, very relevant to have a uh, um, deployment plan that uh, will follow an incremental approach. So the system uh, should be at the end, it should be, uh, let me say, scalable in order to increase uh, the, the capacity where it is, uh, will be really needed. So where and by when it's something that should be carefully analyzed and studied in the production of the deployment plan, that's for sure. And uh, it is in the pipe of our, uh, of our work because again, from the experience, again, from VDMO2, we know that we have some areas where the um, saturation uh, could be reached in few years in some other part of Europe, uh, it could require the more years. So at the end, we need to pay attention on that because it means also to save money in order to, to implement gradually what it is really needed for the users. So the deployment plan at the end will be the right, the right way, in our opinion, in order to manage this type of scalability, this type of uh, requirement at the end. So thanks, Davido. That pretty much uh, su sums up what the topic was of today. And as we are reaching or already have passed our deadline, we are five minutes past. Uh, thanks all for your participation. Uh, sorry for the technical issues we discovered today, some types of provider abort we have seen. Uh, may I ask all of you, if you are not happy left already, uh, to uh, take a few seconds, go to the poll page and rate uh, the contents and the uh, presentation of today. Um, I would like to ask you to skip the technical performance because indeed we had, uh, at least I had uh, suffering quite some issues today, which was unexpected as everything before runs well. And once more, thank you very much for all our speakers. Thanks in particular for Armin to jump in. I definitely noted that. <laughs> and uh, enjoy your evening, have a nice day and take a few seconds to fill out the polls. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.